welcome everybody. We are back with our series on psychology. And today we have the pleasure of talking about Ragnar or Ragnar Donaskold. And he is the pirate. But before we turn to him, we need a disclaimer from the disclaimer man. Dr. Right. I, I have reached the, the apogee of distinctions that anybody could ever aspire to in this world. I am the disclaimer guy for the Atlas Drug Course. So read the book. There's a lot of, read the book first, everybody. There's a lot of uh, spoilers here. And it's a mystery story. You don't want to spoil the mystery. So you have been warned. Read the book, then come You've back and watch, watch this yes. series. Yes. Right. And I'm going to have plot spoilers right at the beginning. So, so, um, so I'm going to start off with just the feel of what people thought about Rania. Then I'm going to move into a little bit of his description and history, and then I will turn it over to Shoshana and then Andy. So um, this is how we are introduced to Rania. They say it's a national, oh no, here it is, sorry. Um, this little spinster, Dagny is at uh, Lillian and Hank's anniversary party. He's listening to five people, older people sitting in front of a fireplace. And there's this elderly spinster who's saying she's afraid of the dark. She's afraid of the night. She said, last night I stayed awake because of the shooting. There were guns going off all night, way out at sea. There were no flashes. There was nothing, just those detonations at long intervals, somewhere in the fog over the Atlantic. Um, and somebody said, well, we think it's the Coast Guard practicing. And she says, why no? It was Ranya Donaskold. It was the Coast Guard trying to catch him. Ranya Donaskold in Delaware Bay. And one of the men said, nobody can catch him. The, the people state of Norway has offered a million dollar reward for his head. And I'm just talking about their conversation now, but that's an awful lot of money to pay for a pirate's head. But how are we going to have any order or security or planning in the world with a pirate running loose all over the seven seas? They say he hides in one of the, those Norwegian fjords where neither God nor man will ever find him. That's where the Vikings used to hide in the Middle Ages. The Navy can't cope with him. It's like something out of the dark ages. So the description of him is he's this really handsome, um, tall, slender man who wears a windbreaker. And Ranyar has the purest gold hair you've ever seen. Um, he's got, um, he's, he's described three different ways as a highwayman, as a judge, and as an efficient bookkeeper. They kind of don't mesh, or at least they don't sound like they do. With the highwayman, think of the scene, and we will talk about these, we'll elaborate with Hank, where he just jumps out on this lonely road that H Hank is walking down a lonely road and he jumps out behind some willow, seemingly behind a willow tree from nowhere. And he's, he's there, um, or he bursts into the window when they're rescuing John Galt. He bursts through the glass window pane. So you see him as a highwayman. Uh, the second is as a judge. Hank sees him as an avenging angel. And the third is as a bookkeeper. Um, Dagny, when he's, when he's collecting the money and he's telling Dagny he, she has this money in Mulligan's bank, uh, he, she said his voice was the tone of a dryly meticulous bookkeeper reading re a report about the financial transfers, bank accounts, income tax returns, as if he were reading the dusty pages of a ledger. Now a little bit about his history. It's a national scandal in Norway. His father was a bishop who excommunicated him, but it had no effect on Rania. He continues to be a pilot. He went to the Patrick Henry University, majored in two subjects. I'm sure Andy will elaborate on these, physics and philosophy. He had two friends. They were inseparable friends. And you see this enormous warmth coming out of him. And uh, he's described as a European aristocrat. So you get both imagery from the Vikings, the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, catapulting Robin Hood, we'll hear about too. And this amazing warmth, this amazing brilliant student um, that we are about to discuss. And Shoshana, you can take it from there. 
Okay. Well, uh, thanks, Ellen, for the background. And part of what's interesting about this character, it's not entirely unique, but that we hear a lot about him before we get a chance to meet him. As a matter of fact, you might think in reading the book that we aren't going to get a chance to meet him at all. Okay, that he's a he's a figure of legend. He's a name, and of course, John Galt is also within the novel. There are, there are legends about John Galt that are farther away in time, and he also is a name. And so I think that because as you're reading the book, uh, well, you've met Francisco, and he's got a mystery, and now you hear about the other two friends, and there's fully a mystery there. I think we're set up to think that this guy also has a mystery associated with him, except of course, that he's involved in daring do, you know, swaggering deeds on the world stage. Now he is a pirate, but we also know that um, he attacks government ships, that, uh, you know, those are, those are his particular targets and that he is more interested in, well, plundering them and sending things to the bottom of the sea than, uh, hurting people. So, you know, he's, he, shall we say he's a selective pirate. Now, what's kind of interesting is, you know, you mentioned the part about bookkeeper and bookkeeper is also a term that's used speculatively by Dr. Stadler to describe Galt. You know, he's probably you know, second assistant bookkeeper. So, yeah, so we got that bookkeepers and well, uh, a bookkeeper might not be um, a swaggering profession, but it certainly is important because a bookkeeper keeps track of things. And, you, you know, so that's why, you know, when you think of him as a judge, well, uh, a bookkeeper is specializing in justice, in accounts, that things need to be accounted for. Now, after all of the buildup, I think he also gets a wonderful entrance, as you say, because he jumps out on a lonely road to talk to Hank Reardon. And th this is very good, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's very dramatic because he has, uh, it's not an accident, it's a plan, and he explains it very well. I think that as a character, we don't have the internal view of him that we do of some, many of the other characters we've spoken about. You know, um, we, we know how Hank Reardon thinks. We know how Dagny thinks. And yes, we also know how Lillian thinks. Well, Lillian Reardon, with, with, uh, with, with our, our, our pirate, we know what he tells us, which is not the same thing as what's going on inside. What I think is very, very powerful though, when he talks to Reardon is that initially Reardon is a hard sell and he doesn't want to, does not want to deal with a pirate. And well, Gonstel makes his case. He explains what he's there for. He explains the connection between his piracy and justice. And justice is something very interesting that you know Reardon's very interested in. And um, I think uh, part of what I like about the scene as you know presenting him is that we know Reardon very well. And so in seeing him, we are seeing him through Reardon's eyes, and we know how he thinks. And you know, that this is a recognizable person. And yet, once the police show up, all they have to do is look at him and, you know, just ask a few questions. And it's going to be big trouble for the pirate because even though he's very good at escaping, he's here without any fancy technology to get him out of there. He's outnumbered, except I guess he and he and Rune together, that's two against two other people. But essentially, you know, he's put himself in danger and that's interesting. Um, I guess I'll say one more thing, which is when we later find out about him, uh, we do hear that his friends don't approve of his activities because of the risk. And we've just seen it. We see him in the act of doing something risky. And you could say he's there to give Reardon back uh, the money that's been taken from him or some of it, you know, because he's he tells him there's an account, there's an account which we're saving the money that has been expropriated from you, but also he wants Reardon to know about justice. You know, he, right. he wants him to know when, another way to look at things. And what I think is very, very powerful here is that just in the course of that conversation, as with Francisco, he yeah. names something important to Reardon and Reardon responds to that because Reardon wants 
he wants visibility, he wants recognition, he wants someone from his own way of looking at things, someone who understands him. Yeah. And just, even though they're very different, that's something he offers him. He's like Francisco in that he speaks to Reardon the words that Reardon needs to hear. Yes. And, yes. and appreciates. Yeah. Okay, Andy. A philosopher pirate. I mean, <laughs> I mean, come on, this is extraordinary. This is so great. You know, I just, you know, only Ayn Rand could have created this character and this scene where he's, he's, he tells Reardon he's after Robin Hood. I mean, I just, when I was a teenager when I read this for the first time and when I read it now, my response is the same. I just laugh at exultation, you know, that this is, that Ayn Rand is showing us life's possibilities and it's, it's magnificent. Uh, yeah, and so is, what does um, Reardon say to him? You, amongst your other, you know, activities, you're also a collector of internal revenue. <laughs> I mean, yes. the, the philosopher part. Now, I, I just wanted to, to say, um, wouldn't you love to see, it wouldn't be a prequel or a sequel. I, I don't know a name, but you know, I make up a name, a simul, a simul quill, you know, of, of Ragnar Donnerskjold's activities during the events of, of Atlas Shrugged. You know, see it from Ragnar's perspective, or one of the seamen, you know, on his on his vessel, and, and go through the adventures with him. Uh, you know, fighting the navies of the you know of these people states around around the world to bring justice. I mean, what a great story that would be if you could find a writer, you know, who is good enough to tell it. You, you know, you won't find somebody like Ayn Rand. There isn't anybody like Ayn Rand. It's just a you know very good writer to tell the that story of 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 the pirate, you know, the pirate for justice. You know, Ragnar Danish called. What a, wow, what a great book that would be in and of, in and of its own right. But anyhow, um, Ragnar, you know, so many of Ayn Rand's characters, again, I've, you know, I've, I've said this all the time. Oh, oh, actually, before I even get to that, I want to I pick up on something that you said, Shoshana, you know, about which Ayn Rand is a master of giving us hearsay about characters before we ever meet the character. And very often there's a lot of misdirection there. You know, it's it's telling us uh, you know one thing about the character's moral stature, and then when we meet the character, we you know often bad, but then when we meet the character, we realize wait a minute, this guy's a hero, or at least a partial hero. And you see that very you know masterfully done with Gail Wynan in the in the Fountainhead, who's even Henry Cameron, you know, on his deathbed, you know, warns Rock against against uh, Wynan and the Wynan papers and everything. You think he's this complete blackguard. And when you meet him, you realize, well, he's a very mixed case with a lot of heroic elements. Well, you hear about Ragnar, the endless hearsay. You know, he's a pirate, for, you know, for God's sake. He's like, you know, he's like Blackbeard. He's a scourge of the seven seas. And then when you meet him, he's anything but. He's this, this towering hero. And Ellen, you were talking about, you know, the estimate that the other heroes have of Ragnar. And there's one, one great scene with, with John Galt when Ragnar comes running in, you know, all excited. He says, John... Sean, he's, guess what? I defy gravity, you know, and Galt says to him, well, you've always done that. You know, what specific form was it this time? You know, and again, I laugh at exaltation at this, at Ragnar's stature, at Galt's recognition, and not just recognition, but his honoring, his homage, you know, to, to Ragnar's uh, stature. Um, so anyways, what, only one, let me make one philosophic point, and that is, um, Many of Ayn Rand's characters, she, she again, she is the absolute master of integrating you know, profound philosophic principles into, into you know, plot structures, you know, real value conflict, and into, into the characterizations. Ragnar is the stylized, he's, he's much more than this, but he's a stylized embodiment of, of the, virtue, the virtue of justice. And he's, you know, he, he, he says as much, well, he doesn't just say as much, he does when, when he risks his life to bring the gold uh, to Hank Reardon, it's not just the gold. He's, you know, he's he tells Reardon, you, know, you have this, you know, this this bank account, and there are there are human beings who care about justice. Who, you know, he says, I, I thought I'd seen everything, but when they took Reardon Medal away from you, you know, even even I couldn't, even I couldn't take it. And you you need to know that, you know, yeah. there are still human beings in the world who care about justice. And who support you, and we, you know, and we're with you financially, morally, in every possible way. And for me, you know, Ragnar, I risked my life to do this, to stand up for for the the producers, you know, the creators, to stand up for them against the 
the moochers and the you know and and the looters and and the parasites and to you know to give people what they deserve, especially to bring uh, honor and positive results, bring the good to the heroes like like Hank Green. And so so Ragnar is risking his life for justice and to honor you know the the heroes in human life who the atlases who carry us on their shoulders and and often get you know. Uh, often get only uh, nothing but abuse or persecution from society and, and from the government. So, you know, Ragnar, Ragnar uh, as a paragon of justice, is a, is a towering hero in the story. Yeah. I'm really glad you, you mentioned him as representing justice in a positive sense, because sometimes people emphasize the negative view of justice, that bad people should get what's coming to them. Right. Right, punishment, you know, courts of law, and so on. Uh, courts of law are not generally uh, concerned with rewarding achievement, um, but well, they're, they're both forms of justice, and this one is even more important. And it's the one that, like the heroes themselves, might be neglected, but that you know, it's very a, important that that's uh, a good that point. he be appreciated. That's a, that's a good point, Shoshana, because in the objectivist ethics that Ayn Rand created. It's it, you know it's important to punish the wicked as you know as Leonard Peikoff puts it in old part, but it's far more important to reward the good. Reward the good is much more important because the good are the ones that make human life possible, and human life is the is the standard of value. So it was Leonard Peikoff's example. You know, it's important for us to point out that that Kant is is mistaken and 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 to be rejected, but it's vastly more important to point out that Aristotle is accurate and to you know and to be. You know, understood and and and, and honored. So so yeah, you're right. Justice is. I, I notice in the story. You know, we get some hint of what happens to the bad guys. You know, society collapses. You know, there's chaos, and maybe they're killed, or maybe they crawl into their rat holes somewhere. You know, and and they escape. You know, uh, they escape death. You know, we see we see Robert's dad dies. We see Jim Taggart goes mad. But a lot of the bad guys, we're not sure what happens to them. But we know what happens to the good guys. They go off to Atlantis. The you know the overwhelming majority of them, and they live happily ever after. And eventually, they come back. You know, and they're gonna uh, recreate the world. And Ayn Rand's focus here is not is not as in her own moral philosophy. Her focus in the story is on the good guys getting the rewards of their virtue much more than on the bad guys getting punishment for their for their evil. And since you just mentioned Aristotle, we shouldn't forget to say that uh, this, uh, yeah, our, uh, we're talking about the one who's a professional philosopher. And right. um, I mean, he studied philosophy and physics, but what he wants to be is, um, you know, he, want, he wants to write philosophy. And when we see him at the end, he's, he's working on Aristotle. Yeah, he's reading, he's reading the metaphysics. Metaphysics, yeah. Right. right. Well, it, it's great because Ayn Rand shows us at the end, you know, uh, Francisco and Reardon are planning you know, the, the revitalization of their industries. And Richard Halley is, you know, is, is playing his latest composition. And Judge Narragansett, we should mention, is crossing out contradictions in an ancient document, you know, the US Constitution mm -hmm. and, and, Bill, and Bill of Rights, you know, and, and making it you know, perfectly in accordance with the principle of individual rights. And of course, Ragnar uh, K. Ludlow is what well, she's where I work with her makeup, she's an actress, yeah, that, she's working with her, with her makeup for some, for some role you know, that, that she'll, she'll play in the future. And of course, Ragnar, the professional philosopher, is reading Aristotle's metaphysics. So before, before you know, Dagny, of course, with Galt, and, and Galt says, it's time, you know, it's time for us to, re, you know, return to the world and traces and space the, sky, the sign of the dollar. So yeah, they're doing what, you know, they're doing in, in accordance with what their professional loves loves are, and Ragnar, Ragnar, you're right. The the philosopher pirate. You can't you can't beat that combination. Right, right. and he, and he's going to be a teacher. You know, yeah, there's a joke Reardon, about yeah, that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Reardon points. I'd love to be in that first classroom when the <laughs> pirate when the pirate is going to teach his intro to philosophy class. <laughs> that, Nobody's that. going to pay attention to what you're saying. They want to know your story. Yeah. Except that he's going to be good, so he's going to. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Rag, 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 anyway. Rag, Ragnar says, I'll tell them that the answer to their questions lies in the yes. subject matter. Yes, he does. Yeah. So I want to go back to Rania and um, meeting Reardon um, for a little bit. And what you notice is that when he jumps out, Reardon 
by by Ryan, we're talking about Ryan's psychology, just the way he carries himself and the way he speaks so um, genuinely and uh, caringly to Reardon, but, but you know, respecting the distance, it, he Reardon immediately knows he's not a bandit and he's not he's not a thief, and um, and he. But Reardon said that his face had no. He initially describes that scene as uh, his face had no expression. It had not changed once while speaking, and it looked as if the man had lost the capacity to feel long ago. And what remained of him were only the features that seemed implacable and dead. With a shudder of astonishment, Reardon found himself thinking that it was not the face of a man, but of an avenging angel. However, when Reardon um, later on went in that same scene, when he, he tells Ron, Reardon saying to Rania, why didn't you just quit? Like Ellis Wyatt, um, um, and or, you know, like the other people, Andrew Stockton and Ken Daniger, and he's, would you have approved of that? And Reardon's realizing he would have approved of that by this time in the story. And that changes Rania's look. Um, the shock that came next was to, was to see Donna Skull's smile. It was like seeing the first green of spring on the sculptured plains of an iceberg. Reardon realized suddenly for the first time that Donna Skull's face was more handsome than it had, that it had the startling beauty of physical perfection, the hard, proud features, the scornful mouth of a Viking statue. Yet he had not been um, aware of it, almost as if the dead sternness of the face had forbidden the impertinence of an appraisal, but the smile was brilliantly alive. And later on, he says that. Rania can feel that what he's seeing is that his feelings were so profoundly deep that you were just seeing Rania was coming across as unfeeling, but it was just because he, beneath them, he had very deep feelings. Shoshana, you look like you found something. No, I was just uh, thinking about the way that he talks to Reardon and he asks him, what are you working for? Yes. Oh, that which was is, well, that's the store we came in. You know, that's, that's, uh, Right. Francisco said, I'm, you know, I'm here to call your attention to the nature of those for whom you're working. And, you know, work is such a big value in the book that for our, the heroes who don't, who, whom we meet before they go on strike, that's the real question for them. You know, my work, my work, how, how can I go on strike? And what they need to learn is, what are you working for? You know, what are you actually accomplishing? And I think, you know, he's getting a refresher course on this. And, it's really dramatic for him because I think that if um, he really hates Francis, he hates the idea that Francisco was a man without a purpose, and then he finds out he was wrong about that. And here's someone who hasn't simply quit being a philosophy professor, but is visible, you know, is 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 out there in the world, and who is not failing in some of his enterprises as Francisco is, but is succeeding brilliantly. But at at being a pirate which let's just say, don't try this at home. You know, don't, you know, listeners don't, 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 don't go out and be pirates because um, in general, uh, be, being a pirate is not a, not a moral thing to do. It's not a good job. Um, and it's puzzling to Reardon, you know, how, how can you look the way you look? How can you talk the way you talk? Don't expect me to approve of your being a pirate. So I say, Ayn, Ayn Rand is uh, brilliant because what she's doing here is she's showing Reardon in the form of a pirate that being a pirate is comparatively better. Better than, than Directive 10-289. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in a world of 10-289, a, a pirate is the healthy person. Plus- Right, so th just let me say something here, you know, about the pirate because Ragnar points out to him that, you know, when, when the law becomes criminal, then the only way to do justice is to be an outlaw, you know, yeah. is to step outside the boundaries of the law, which is which is what he's done. And one thing that um, is beautiful in that scene is Ayn Rand sets it up that Hank is as desolate as can be. He, he's walking home to, um, he's not walking to his home, he's walking towards Philly, a two mile walk. 
he is just so he doesn't want to see another soul so he picks a back country road and his view of humans is just beside Dagny and probably Francisco, but it's just going down the tubes. He doesn't want to be touched by them anymore. This is after his, I think the medal had been taken from, yeah, the medal had yeah. been taken from. And when he meets R Rania, Rania throughout it is, he, he's speaking like Francisco is speaking to Riordan. You know, he's speaking Riordan's language. And at the end, you learn that it's not just the bar of gold that Reardon needs, but Reardon needs to know that good men exist, that, and that that's evidence of it, that Rania exists. That, and that theme goes throughout Atlas Shrug. But I think Rania, in giving that gift to Reardon, it was much more, it was not so much the gold, but the philosophy, the moral code that he was giving Hank and the knowledge that that one person exists who knows this. And the, that, there, that there are men in the world, there are yes. people in the world who care about justice and about honoring and, and rewarding the good. Yeah, that's much more valuable to read than, than the gold. And gold. Yeah, yeah, much, much more. So I want to say something you mentioned, you know, the, that Ayn Rand describes Ragnar as this, you know, this real manly specimen of, of physical beauty. And yeah, you know, and I, so I read that, that for the first time in 19, 1960s, you know, and, uh, and masculine beauty has, you know, no impact on me. But, but uh, I remember roughly 30 years ago and I had never heard of Brad Pitt. And I think it was 1992, A River Runs Through It. I don't know if you ever, if you ever saw that, that movie. The, the first time I ever saw, I didn't even know who he was. Just this, this, this beautiful, you know, even I was like, wow, who's that? You know, this beautiful, <laughs> manly specimen, this tall blonde guy. And the first thing that ran through my mind is, uh, there's Ragnar Donnerschko. You know, this, that's, that's the way Ayn Rand described, describes Ragnar. And the, the important thing of, about Ragnar, of course, is that his, his, it's a cliche to say so, but it's an important truth nevertheless, his inner beauty matches his outer beauty. He's, he's, a, moral, he's a moral paragon who risks his life every day in service of the good. And he says, if I lose my life, what better cause to have lost it for than, for the, than to stand up for human ability, you know, and for, the, and, for, and for the men and women, the men and women of the mind in effect, who are the atlases who carry the world on their shoulders. You know, if I lose my, if I lose my life, it's gonna be in service of the most noble cause imaginable. So his, his, his inner beauty, his moral character matches his physical, his physical look, and, and he and he and his wife, you know, uh, Dagny thinks. I mean, they're just they're, she's this beautiful actress, and they're just this stunning, this stunning couple. And the, the best thing about it, of course, is when you find somebody like that. Uh, you know, sometimes the cliche is that beautiful people are often internally shallow. No reason that has to be true, though. There's no reason why you know, you have your mind or your moral character can't match your you know your 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 good looks. And, in, and of course, in, in the characters of Ragnar and Kate Ludlow, Ayn Rand shows us that. Um, so we could go back. I wanted to pick up on a scene with Eddie. Um, Eddie is talking about, um, Eddie actually explains how Boyle's mills were blown up. So we get to see Ranyar in action through Eddie's description. I think, He's Ranyar is explained, described as a man who's used to giving commands, who's used to giving orders mm -hmm. by Reardon. But he said, he's, Eddie says to the man in the cafeteria, but well, listen, the night before they were to start, Oil's men were heating the furnaces in that place on the coast when they, they heard a voice. They didn't know where it, whether it came from a plane or radio of some sort of loudspeaker but it was a man's voice. And it said that he would give them 10 minutes to get out of the place. They got out, they started going and they just kept going because the man's voice had said that he was Rania Donisco. In the next half hour, Boyle's mills were raised to the ground. Um, they think it might've been these long range naval guns from somewhere out in the Atlantic. And Eddie said, you know, when I was 15 years old, I used to wonder how any man could become a criminal. I couldn't understand what would make that possible. 
Now I'm glad that Ranya Adonis Gold has blown up those mills. May God bless him and never let them find him where, wherever and whatever he is. So just the justice of Eddie seeing through to the, to the real justice that Ranya represents. Yeah, well, I think that it's, it's part of the decline of civilization that we're seeing in Atlas Shrugged that, uh, well, uh, Reardon meets someone, you know, a young boy who's sort of the head of a, of a gang and he thinks that in a better world he would be rising and producing and here he'll probably be dead soon. And of course, uh, Reardon himself is, I mean, a sale between consenting adults is a big crime and, and he and and he and Ken Daniger committed that crime. So we've already, you could say, crossed the line in of, with amateur criminals. And um, uh, but uh, yeah, Dennisfield has made it professional. That's what he's good at, and he's not going to get caught. Right. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good point you you, you raised, Shoshana. That deal that Rian was doing with that young that young kid with hard eyes was he mining coal by night or, yeah. or I don't remember but yeah Rian thinks in a freer society this kid would be a brilliant entrepreneur he'd be you know he'd be a great success but in a status regime he's gonna end up in dead or in, in prison at a, at, a, at a very young age and here's the here's what Ayn Rand is, is showing us again it goes back to Ragnar that um, the, the good news here is his Ragnar the outlaw who's avenging justice the bad news is when the only way to bring justice is to step outside the law because the law is so uh, viciously immoral that society is in serious decline, the society is in big trouble. And he is the genius of John Galt. In the absence of, of John Galt's insight about this, the strike, there, there would be no way to, there, there may well be no other way to triumph. So uh, yeah, Ayn Rand brilliantly showing us a society in, egregious it's not even moral decline it's like a moral collapse you yeah. know by this point where the best where the best people in order to make human life possible are necessarily required to step outside the law and become criminals so i think and i think it's time to go step into atlantis if you guys are ready <laughs> always, always ready to go to atlantis Ellen. And and it, so we first hear Rania. Rania comes in for the month for the annual breakfast, and he sees Dag. He learns that Dagny is there. Dagny is the scab, and um, and so we're and the in, gate and the gate crasher, and the gate crasher, and uh, and so um, uh, John Galt is asking him. You know, this is a little later now, but they're talking about breakfast. Uh, oh no, Dagny said, you don't have to be frightened, Miss Taggart. I'm not dangerous to anyone in Galt's Gulch. And she could only shake her head before she recaptured her voice to say, it's not what you're doing to anyone, it's what they're doing to you. <laughs> so by that time, Dagny's already come quite a distance. And then Galt asked him, lost any battles? And he says, no, you know, and then he talks about, um, but he said that he, he was in some danger, you know, that Hank Reardon saved his life. He said, you're going to get him soon because he, Hank Reardon, because he's hanging by a thread and it, he's just about ready to fall at your feet. He's a man who saved my life. So you can see how far he's um, come. You weren't in any danger, were you, says Gold. And he said, it was the most enjoyable encounter I have ever had. This is with the gold, uh, with Hank Reardon, and um, him giving Hank Reardon the gold. I've been waiting to tell you about it in person. It's a story you'll want to hear. Do you know who the man was? Hank Reardon. Uh, so, uh, so I think we could go into the valley and we could even start to talk a little bit about the fact that Dagny discovers that he is married. <laughs> and that's a bit of a shock. So either one of you want to take it there, from there? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because we don't see much of, of Kay Ludlow, the beautiful actress who, you know, who Ragnar marries. And, you know, she says, um, you know, that in the movie industry and, and uh, you know, in Broadway theater and stuff, there's really no parts for her. They, 
they always want to use her, her beauty to, you know, to play the seductress who in the end is defeated by the small town, you know, the small town girl or, or, or something like that. And there's no, there's no roles for her. You know, this is, she's, she, she's capable of playing such a brilliant heroine. She could be Dagny Taggart, you know, in the film version of Atlas Shrugged. She could be Antigone. She could be St. Joan, you know, in, the, in, in Bernard Shaw's play. And yet there's, there's just not enough roles uh, for her. So I uh, see because she, she explains why she went on strike. But the inter the, to me, the interesting thing about Kay Ludlow is that she, um, uh, again, way Ayn Rand, and she's a secondary character. She doesn't show up that much in Atlas Shrugged. But again, Ayn Rand often just integrates philosophy with, with her characters. And we see Kay Ludlow living out you know, when Ayn Rand uh, considers the benevolent universe premise that she can she can live with the knowledge that the man she loves and the man she married is in danger every day of his life, practically every minute of his life, because one, I mean, she she recognizes that Ragnar is a man of extraordinary intellect and ability who, who can outthink you know, the naval captains of the world. Two, he's got a ship with Gault's motor that can outrun them. But three, we don't expect disaster. We expect, you know, the benevolent universe premise means that the world is open to value achievement on the part of rational human beings. And they don't expect to be defeated by the irrational. They know she doesn't expect Ragnar to lose. She expects, what did Ragnar say? That he's teaching the looters a lesson. He's teaching them what happens when brute force means, meets mind plus force. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, exactly. And so uh, again, the benevolent universe premise is the world is open to, to value achievement by rational human beings and mind plus force. Ragnar is you know epitome of a rational human being. She expects him to triumph. She lives in the benevolent universe, not a malevolent universe. Otherwise it would just be unbearable you know, to live with that knowledge every day that her husband is in a severe danger of, of, of lo losing his life. Andy, let me read that quote because that's a beautiful quote. Um, this is uh, Dagny's actually speaking to Rania at this point. And um, she said, how can she, you know, live 11 months with you as a pirate out there? And he was smiling but he saw the enormous solemnity of that which he and his wife had needed. To, uh, she saw the enor enormous solemnity of that which he and his wife had needed to earn the right to this kind of a smile. Quote, she can live through it, Miss Target, because we do not hold the belief that this earth is a realm of misery where man is doomed to destruction. We do not think that tragedy is our nat natural fate and we do not live in chronic dread of disaster. We do not expect disaster until we have a specific reason to expect it. And when we encounter it, we are free to fight it. It is not happiness, but suffering that we consider unnatural. It is not success, but calamity that we regard as the abnormal exception in human life. And that speaks to the benevolent universe premise right. that you're talking about, Andy. Yeah, well, I, I think that um, this this is an important aspect of his thinking, you know, that he's concentrating on his mission and not all the things that might go wrong. I think it's also fair to say that in his current situation, it's prudent to think about the bad things that might happen. And we're not that far in the novel from the point where they think it's not safe for all right. to go bad. To go so bad. there does come a point when it's not the benevolent universe won't protect you from the looters. Yeah. And it's it's important for the characters to know when it's not, when they, they need to enjoy the benevolent universe in Atlantis and not in New York. I'm just saying, you know, I, th I think it's, it's, it's maybe especially moving that this comes here, which is fairly close to the end of the book. Yeah, and they name all the negative things that are happen will yes. happen that they will see when they go back to the world, and they're all negative things. You know, everything's going to collapse on your heads. You know, don't go back, John. Don't go back, Dad. You yeah, know, that's a good point, Shoshana. Um, Thank you. That no, that well, you're welcome. But um, that there's a principle in in Ayn Rand's metaphysics that to be is to be finite, and. Uh, there's, there's nothing that's boundless, you know, uh, and that, that includes the benevolent universe premise. There are limits 
everything. So I was just thinking of the White Rose, you know, those uh, extraordinarily courageous freedom fighters in Nazi, Nazi Germany who, uh, who apprehended and guillotined you know, by the, by the Nazis. Uh, uh, if human beings are rational and if they're free to act, then we're living in a benevolent universe where values can be achieved. But if we're irrational and or we're under the control of irrational others like Nazis, or communists, then yeah, we're not in the, the benevolent universe premise is true metaphysically, but in a given political social context, that, no, it's been, it's been, the, you know, it's, it's not, it hasn't been negated, but it's, it's it, the political situation makes it impossible for rational human beings to act. That you're going to be killed. You're going to be murdered by the bad guy. So, you know, like Kira's got to try to escape from, you know, from uh, that situation in We the Living and uh, Equality's got escapes and sets up a, a free society in, in Anthem. You got to get away from the bad, you know, and Gwalt, you know, and his, and his supporters do, the, do a similar thing. They, they get away to the valley, to, to Atlantis, in order to establish a, a, a free society. So, so yeah, every, everything is bounded, including the benevolent universe premise. So just cutting back to Kay a little bit, because I think we need to return to the benevolent universe premise. Very good point, though. When, when there's a lot of evil, you can't be sitting there and putting on rose-colored glasses and saying, I'm living in the benevolent universe. <laughs> well, you can, but your life expectancy is severely delimited. Okay. Yeah. So um, what I love is when Dagny goes to see the play, I'm sure we all love that scene. And, uh, um, and Dagny, uh, Dagny is thinking and she says, not since sh childhood had she felt that sense of exhilaration that she's watching Kay Ludlow, that sense of exhilaration after witnessing the performance of a play, the sense that life held things worth reaching, not the sense of having studied some aspect of a sewer there had been no reason to see. Um, and it, it just that, that view of what Ayn Rand gave all of us with Atlas Shrugged and a lot more, <laughs> just with her personal being, but that sense that, that you can make your life exciting and wonderful and interesting and uh, with Ryan now, you can see you can fight for justice. And he's married to this beautiful actress. And I think it's also wonderful that they've got art. And you know, the, the, oh, in the valley, that's the, right? That's one of the that's one of the necessities that they need, even on their schedule. And yeah. the fact that there's a play means we've got some other good people. We got a playwright. I mean, right. I don't think uh, Kay Gon Kay Gonter. I don't think Kay, Kay Ludlow wrote her own lines. We got a director. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've got the people who put put it together. We've got the other actors. I, I think that um, it's obvious that we've got more people in the Valley than we got a chance to meet. But I think it's also true that with uh, certain plays, you need an excellent uh, lead actor and they've got one and possibly we're thinking of this play as being built around her. And I, I think it's, well, I, I think it's, it's, it's good that she's there as a representative of art, uh, the writer is a character, but we don't, you know, we don't know much about that. We know a little bit more about the kind of play that uh, Kay Ludlow was in, as opposed to the kind of films she was would have been able to be in in the outside world. I think it's also interesting. I mean, it's obvious, but it's interesting that Dacne's not allowed to go to the physics lectures. Mm -hmm. Just saying, you know, that's that's interesting. She's not allowed to go to the physics lectures, but she's allowed to go to the play and to the concerts because, well, it's not as if she could remember the whole play and bring it to the outside world and then, oh no, now the outside world has got a good play. That wouldn't work. It's also not knowledge in the same sense that would be of, in a way that would be of use to people in the outside world. You know, while the physics lectures presumably, um, if Daphne went and learned everything from the physics lectures, that would be a security risk. Mm. It's just interesting. I, I thought that was interesting because, um, well, for one thing, it's a dramatic demonstration of they need art here too, and they enjoy art here too. And even, well, the people in all the different professions can right. and, enjoy and, and appreciate it, art. And to your point, Shoshana, Ayn Rand wrote herself into the into briefly yeah, into as the, the writer, and, right? You know, with the big eyes, who who was in love with John Galt. Uh, maybe maybe she was the author of the play, although although she was described as a novelist. 
if I recall. But Ayn Rand's primarily a novelist and wrote some very good drama, you know, mm -hmm, as well. That's true. But yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I, I, I mean, Ayn Rand, again, showing uh, something in action that people have, rational people have identified for thousands of years, and that is the profound human need for art. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how brilliant we are and like, you know, we could be brilliant in physics or any other field, but art is a need. Art is a need of the human soul. And, you know, everybody in the Valley recognizes that. Or maybe Ken Danica has just come to realize it as he, he says, he says it all again, he didn't have an appreciation for such things. But now I think Ken Danica probably does. Right. And you just see the enormous self-confidence that, that all of her characters in the Valley have. But Kay Ludlow certainly has it, <laughs> and Rania, who we're talking about, just self-confidence, self-esteem. Uh, their view of the world is that it's open to them. Um, I, I want to briefly mention something I thought was beautiful, which was the way that Ayn Rand first introduces us, very artistically, mind you, to Kay Ludlow. She, she says, on the edge of the road, that Dagny's learning about the valley, on the edge of the road, she, Dagny, saw a structure made of glass sheets held together by a wood, wooden framework. But for one instance, it seemed to her that it was only the frame for the painting of a woman, a tall, fragile woman with pale blonde hair and a face of such beauty that it seemed veiled by distance, as if the artist had been merely able to suggest it not to make it quite real. In the next instant, the woman moved her head and Dagny realized that there were people at the tables inside the structure and that it was a cafeteria, that the woman, that, that the woman who stood behind the counter was Kay Ludlow, the movie star who once seen could never be forgotten, uh, the star who had retired and vanished five years ago. Um, and of course, four years ago, she got married in the valley to Rania. <laughs> They, they did. So just the beauty, that, the way that Ayn Rand introduces her character, we already get the feeling of this um, beautiful, I mean, think of the, your favorite female leads, you know, just character, uh, that Kay Ludlow was your, one of your best, I don't know if you have favorite female leads. Well, you know, the young Elizabeth Taylor comes to mind because she was, she was brunette and, and was dark, but that kind of strike, you may, you, you, if you ever saw National Velvet, for instance, that's the eyes, you know, the, the, those violet eyes of Elizabeth, the young Elizabeth Taylor. She was, you know, she was, she was stunning. And that's yeah. the way, you know, Kate, they don't look, they have a different look, but that kind of stunning beauty. You know, Greta Garbo is a yeah, favorite Garbo, right. performer of, of Ayn Rand's and she did leave. Right. She did that's stop right. performing because she, uh, the, the roles of those late films are, not good or conventional. So um, I, getting back to Ranyar, I wanted to, uh, we did Kay, we, we talked about Kay quite a bit, but I wanna get back to end with Ranyar, we could all say something. Um, he, there's a quote here that I'd like to read. He's talking, this is Ranya speaking, um, saying that uh, John does, uh, don't be shocked, Miss Taggart, uh, and don't object. He's, I'm used to getting objections. He's telling her that she's got the, this money. He said, I'm sort of a freak here anyway in the Valley. None of them approve of my particular method of fighting our battle. John doesn't, Dr. Axton doesn't. They think that my life is too valuable for it. But you see, my father was a bishop and, all of his, and in all of his teachings, there was one sentence that I accepted. All they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. And he's teaching that violence is not practical. Here the pirate is teaching us violence is, is not practical. If my fellow men believe that force, that the force of the combined tonnage of their muscles is a practical means to rule me, let them learn the outcome of a contest in which there's nothing but brute force on one side and force ruled by the mind on the other, which you mentioned. Even John grants me that in our age, I had the moral right to choose the course I've taken. I'm doing just what he's doing in my own way. Mm -hmm. He is withdrawing man's spirit from the looters. I'm withdrawing the products of man's spirit. 
He's depriving them of reason. I'm depriving them of wealth. He is draining the soul of the world. I'm draining its body. His is the lesson they have to learn. Only I'm impatient and I'm hastening their scholastic process, progress. But like John, I'm simply complying with their moral code and refusing to grant them a double standard at my expense or at Reardon's or yours. Yeah. Well so, said. and so, um, so, so he's a professor too. He's right. a professor too. So yeah. we, could, we have a lot more to say about Rania because we will, when we talk about Dr. Axton, we will talk about his relationship. He's one of Dr. Axton's three students. And we can do that when we talk about, we can save that for uh, when we talk about Dr. Axton. Any final words on Rania and his psychology? Well, well Shoshana, Shoshana yeah, you're well, right. Is, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. He's a professor all the way through. He's, he's uh, the pirate is, is teaching mankind a lesson and then he's gonna be in the classroom teaching students a lesson. So Ragnar is a, is a uh, professor you know, in, in the midst of, uh, even in the midst of being a pirate. And that's, that's who he is, you know, uh, in, in different forms. He's a professor in different forms. Okay, I just wanted to comment that um, the, the name Donskjold, uh, it is a, it's a name in a Victor Hugo novel. And um, when I, yeah, um, when one of, one of his teenage books, and when uh, I, it was pointed out to Iron Man, she said, yes, but it's a real name. So, yeah. you know, so it's a real name, but it's also like a little nod. And I, I could imagine Victor Hugo doing a good job with this character, you know, just because of the, the drama and the color and the excitement. Um, now, I think in this, uh, Andy thinks it would be good to have a whole book around him. And I I also would like to read the other yeah. adventures <laughs> of, of this character. But I, I think it's also true that in the book that we have, well, there's quite a bit of competition for who the leads are going to be. And more time for him might mean less time for some of the other characters. What Ayn Rand does, which is of course wonderful, is that she uses her time very well. And she manages to you know, give us the scene with Reardon, to give us the legends, to give us the marriage to Kay, and to give us a philosophical discussion and the little nod over to Aristotle at the end. And we haven't even talked about the Robin Hood lecture. We haven't which, done that. Is right, you which, that? well, part of what that means is that he's, he, He's a professor, and so he's got a good way of explaining, uh, in terms of something familiar to some people, what his policy is. So regardless, and he points out that he's dealing not with necessarily the historical Robin Hood, but what the legend has come to mean. And I think that's that'll do. You know, I'm not uh, that uh, he's he's not based. He's not. He doesn't really mean that I am out to make sure no one ever says anything good about Robin Hood ever again. But what he is talking about is the moral code of need being a claim that's it. Yeah. and that that's contrary to justice and that he is justice right right yeah that's a scene that's again it's a brilliant scene it's so innovative and original only Ayn Rand could have conceived it never mind uh executed it and, and right you're right Shoshan he's, he, he says the the real life Robin Hood may well have been stealing from the thieving rich to give back to the productive poor but that's not the legend. He's, the legend is that he's a champion of need, not of productivity. So he's what he says. He says, "I'm stealing from the, from the thieving poor. Yeah, I'm stealing from the poor to give to the rich." I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's so brilliantly original the way he turns it around. But of course, you know, the justice of it. He's not stealing from the poor. Actually, he's stealing from the government, who's who's the robbing the government. yeah, who's robbing yes. the yeah. robbing the the productive, yeah. robbing the productive rich. Uh, and then giving it back to the productive rich like Reed. And so that hence, you know, active restitution is, is justice. And of course, you know, part of Ayn Rand's leitmotif here, of course, is the poor don't do well under these socialist statist regimes that the looters, the looters stand for. What the, where the poor do well is under capitalism, you know, the, 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 the system that she upholds and that her heroes uphold in, in the story. Okay, so we, we can wrap it up for Ranyar. Always pleasant to return back to him though. And we will do that when we speak with, uh, we talk about Dr. Axton, Dr. Hugh Axton. 
So I want to thank you very much, Dr. Andrew Bernstein, Dr. Shoshana Milgram, and I'm Dr. Ellen Kenner. And we've talked today about the psychology of Ranyar, Donna Skold, and Kay Ludlow. Thank you, Ellen. Good job. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Have Thanks, a good Ellen. day, Shoshana, Ellen. Okay.